uh, welcome to to the second part of our um, of our, of our tutorial. Um, my name is uh, is Andrei Bursuk, and I will be speaking in this part about um, assertivity estimation and uh, the related ensemble approaches. So, um, I'm, uh, regarding myself, I'm a researcher at uh, the Valley AI, working around uh, this uh, this uh, this topic in the perception of um, of the environment around the uh, autonomous vehicle. And this part is, is quite critical uh, for uh, for uh, for us. The way we designed this uh, this tutorial is that in, in the first part we'll look a bit about broader and more theoretical aspects, like uncertainty estimation and um, and uh, in calibration. And in the second part, uh, we will be looking at ways where these uh, these uh, these uh, tools can come into practice on some uh, some uh, some specific tasks that we we have in, in practical uh, in practical settings namely distribution shift to domain adaptation and uh, auto distribution uh, detection so to start first uh, a bit of why is this useful to is useful to to have a certainty estimation well good uncertainty estimates uh, allow us to quantify when can we put some faith and trust in in the models predictions so this when you're integrating in in a, in a decision system helps in uh, in avoiding mistakes but also improve, improves the reliability of whatever other blocks are uh, downstream or, uh, or or in connection or depend with uh, with uh, with our current uh, current uh, current functions. So for example, if you have a perception uh, block that is collected then uh, to a planning and motion estimation uh, in controller and in the vehicle, knowing that the decision that we uh, that we make or the prediction that we make at the perception block will help take a better decision for the control part uh of the vehicle well, particular to to stop the vehicle or steer uh to some direction or on, on under depending on the type of the prediction that uh, that uh, that we make so to understand a bit the concept of uncertainty estimation i would propose first to look at uh analyze a few uh, use cases where we can see that there's different types of uh types of uncertainty come into play when we uh when we uh, we uh, we are dealing with with difficult cases so broadly i will be looking at two main types of uncertainty today uh each of it uh, has its own uh, peculiarities um and i'm putting a disclosure here so for the uh, the uh, disclaimer sorry for the, the scope of this tutorial we'll be looking more at specification uh there's a lot of work on on the grid as well it's just to to try to to fit in the, the, in the available time we will stick just for classification, but the examples will be telling also for for people working on on, on regression problems. So, I'll study uh, a few cases. As I said, uh, we'll look first at, at case one. So here we have uh, a simple uh, classification problem where we have three classes and we have samples from from each of these classes, and uh, which are the test uh, training data. And now at test time, I will have this uh, this pink point. Uh, which is uh, for which I'll have to make a decision. So we can see that this pink point is somewhere close to this uh, this mid uh, mid blue uh, mid blue cluster. So even though it's at the border, so it, it's oriented, it's close to to the other class as well. We can say well with with some confidence that uh, this pink point belongs to to this class here. Now, let me change this the, the problem a bit with the, with the, this a different type of data. So again, here we have three three uh, classes. We, uh, denoted by uh, by the different shades of uh, of blue as a color, but you can see that there's quite a bit of uh, overlap with them, in particular on this area. So now, when we come with our when we have our pink test sample here, uh, we will may we'll have a hard time deciding because the decision boundary in between these uh, these classes is is not clear. So if I wouldn't have colored uh, these uh, these uh, these uh, points with different uh, with different shades of blue, it would have been impossible to figure out which class is which. Uh, so imagine that from a machine learning perspective, this is a bit of a, it's, it's quite it's quite difficult. So we we what we can say is that for this sample is that it's somewhere in between this class here and this class there, but we cannot uh, ad adequately say uh, reliably say which uh, which is the most likely class uh, out of that. So this this type of setting uh, is actually not that uh, uncommon in practice, and uh, it, it relates to what we call the the aleatoric or or data uncertainty so i'll be using these terms inter uh, interchangeably so aleatoric is a more um, uh, more classic term from uh, from literature but my sometimes it, it might not be too clear or well, it might be too complex for, uh, for 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 people so an alternative way to referring to that is is the data uncertainty so i'll pick up the 
the denomination proposed by Alexander Malimin, uh, Andrei Malimin, sorry, in his uh, in his PhD thesis. So, uh, well, to 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 show you a bit more uh, more uh, visually some other examples of where this uh, data uncertainty comes into play. So it's often encountered in in similarly looking objects. So, for example, well, this uh, this example is quite known already um, on, uh, on on social media, where we have ob different two types of objects with uh, namely a dog and a, and a pretzel. And uh, when they are in this position, they uh, they can be easily confused by a classifier, but also by a human, as they they look very much look alike. Same here for this uh, this curly dog and these uh, these nuggets. You can see that well. At the first sight, without uh, analyzing too much, without squinting too much into the details of this image, we can see that these uh, these objects can be fairly fairly similar in in appearance. So this this is a specific this is a uh, common instance of a uh, of a uh, of a uh, data uncertainty. Uh, what we have here, for example, kind of going in up on the, on the same idea. So many ImageNet uh, trained models. Well, a few years ago, I, I don't think it's the case till, uh, till now. When seeing this type of image, it would have classified it as a barbecue or a grill. And what we have here, some uh, some uh, some um, some dogs on a, on a, on a, on an airflow uh, uh, grill uh, that you have uh, in the cities. So it's you can say that it's a fair mistake because well, it's a it's a very very similar uh, similar setting. But we may need to to know that we're dealing with this uh, this type of uh, sample to take a better uh, decision. So returning to, to my original, well, my daily day to time use case on autonomous driving perception. <clears throat> so I'm taking here some examples from um, uh, from uh, from the real world that we encountered as instances of uh, of uh, aleatory uncertainty of data uncertainty. So classes that look alike are pedestrians, cyclists, or person that you may find in different uh, states. For example, walking or on a, on, a, on a bicycle, or when they are on a, on a scooter or a trottinette. Um, uh, these vehicles that run around the, the cities. Uh, similarly, whenever a, uh, an annotator needs to decide between two classes, we have road and sidewalk. And, uh, and in general, uh, aleatoric uncertainty is commonly found at the object boundaries because annotators may not have the same precision in annotating the boundary between the objects. So I'm taking this example from uh, from the paper of um, Yaringal and uh, in Alex Kendall. Uh, where they show on semantic segmentation some instances of uh, of this data uncertainty. So we can see here that far away objects that we cannot see this well that are difficult to distinguish. You you have a higher uncertainty. So higher uncertainty is um, is more uh, high, uh, with a uh, red to yellow color. Well, while low uncertainty is a, is a, is dark blue. And in general, we always see it as you can see here on the object frontiers of the objects. So it's always at the boundaries of the objects because there's some ambiguity in the annotation. So sometimes the sidewalk might be a bit left, sometimes it might be a right in the, in the annotation. So this reflects then in the predictions of the of the neural network. Same here, road and sidewalk. So there's some confusion on the on the sidewalk, probably because in some other cases it has been annotated as a as a as road. Um, Aleatoric uncertainty is often also caused by uh, by the limitations of the sensor. So, for instance, if we take the task of uh, pedestrian detection in 3D, so given a monocular uh, monocular image, we have to detect the, the the pedestrian in the 3D space. So, to estimate also the distance. So, in general, these types of uh, algorithms, the further the object is from the camera, you can see the the fewer pixels we have, and the less precise we can we can be in this prediction. So if a, if a, if a pedestrian is like two meters, five meters from uh, from the camera, we can have we can detect that pedestrian easily in 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 space. So it's a, we have enough pixels. Uh, the the weave is clear, so we can detect it very well. However, when the pedestrians are somewhere in the depending on the camera beyond 20, 25 meters or 30 meters, we can see that well the the prediction is not that accurate because the view, uh, the number of pixels, the limitations of the cameras do not allow us to to figure out this uh, this uh, this well, so in this paper, uh, Mondo Loco by uh, by Bertoni et al. They've used this uh, to uh, to fit some uh, some uncertainty in the evaluation process to have some flexibility in the detection of the of the pedestrians. So we can see this pedestrian here, although the ground truth is somewhere there. Uh, the um, uh, the the prediction is uh, is, uh, is, uh, is 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 so the ground truth is here and the prediction is made here in red. Uh, the ground of is blue and the prediction is red so we can see that the further we are from the camera the more error we have so here is another example from new scenes 
where the pedestrians are again also quite quite far away beyond 25 meters and we can see that we in general we have um, a bigger uh, error because of the uncertainty present here so we cannot physically distinguish these objects given the camera uh, this type of uh, of uncertainty is also encountered in some other mainstream data sets like cipher where we have these low resolution images and often some objects because of that because we have just very few pixels to look at uh the annotation well the the, the some images it, some images you can have a easy, easily a class confusion because they look uh, very much uh, very much alike at, at this uh, this low resolution the objects that we uh, we want to recognize uh, finally another another instance of um, of data uncertainty in practical settings is related to uh, samples that are very difficult or ambiguous to to, to annotate and often they have disagreements so here, for example, we have um, an example from a, from a data set from medical imaging where we want to detect uh, segment uh, tumors. So here on each line, uh, so we, in the first row, we have uh, we have the, some, some images. And then on the following four, four rows, we have annotations from different experts. And what we can see is that there's an, a disagreement between, uh, between the experts. So there's almost never two, uh, two, three experts that tell us the same thing, maybe in this case here uh about the the uh, the, uh, the tumor to uh, to segment so so there's a disagreement at the level of the grader so this means that it's a very difficult and ambiguous task and uh, if, if uh, this is the case for your task this will be needed to take into consideration and there are specialized methods for for dealing with this uh, this type of uncertainty when we have an annotation degree agree disagreement sorry so uh wrapping up on the data uncertainty so this is a type of uncertainty that we often encounter in practice due to, to the sensor quality, but also to and the, its limitation, but also to the natural randomness that we found in the real world. So it cannot be explained by uh, by our data. So another example here that we that we have is a, is a, the sun glare. Again, this perturbs as visibility. Uh, here we have raindrops or, or nighttime. So we can see this is a, a limitation of the sensor. So a camera cannot see that well in the night. So this is as much as it can do. So I stress here that this data uncertainty, also implied by the name, is related to the is due to the properties of the data, and uh, because of that, we often uh, call it a irreducible uncertainty because then we cannot reduce it given the current uh, conditions. We can learn it, however, uh, we can reduce it eventually by uh, by having better sensors like the camera with uh, with, uh, with with better focal and better better specs or adding an additional sensor like LiDAR or infrared to support the, the visibility for, uh, for one of these sensors. Uh, a final word on that. Uh, we often, well, we, we call this also the known unknown in, uh, in layman words, which will be maybe easier to, to remember from, uh, from now on on how types of, what type of problems can we deal or are reflected by, uh, by this uh, data uncertainty. So moving on to, to the next case. So uh, here, Again, I have three classes in my training set, but then at test time I come with this uh, with this pink point here, which is farther away from uh, from uh, from my training distribution, and and it can have actually different uh, well different meanings. It can be something that is from a completely different class uh, from the the items that we we've seen so far. It can be an anomaly, but it can also be something uh, well one of the classes that we have learned. Maybe if the decision boundary is like that, it will be somewhere uh, belonging to this class. But if the decision boundary is like that and it belongs to this class, it could be outside there. So, so we cannot say much about it. It's just that it's something that we haven't dealt with before. And, uh, and uh, this is the type of cases that we, we encountered for the second type of uncertainty, which we call epistemic uh, or the knowledge uncertainty. So is this is related to the knowledge of the of the model that we we have trained so epistemic means also knowledge in uh, in uh, in greek so uh, well i'll stick to the to the to the knowledge uncertainty mob, uh, name but well, from time to time i apologize i might be referring to it at a step but they're epistemic but they're know that well, we can use them uh use them both uh usually while well, in papers you you will uh, you know, it will be easy to figure out which type of uncertainty mean so to a few words about the type of uh, of these uh, types of these uh, uh, these samples, I mean, this, uh, this type of, uh, of instances of this type of uncertainty. So to, to illustrate that, I will be showing a bit the, the assumptions that we have usually in, in machine learning of IID, uh, in, in, uh, where we have, a, a, we, we have 
uh, in the independently and identically distributed, where we have a training distribution uh, and the test distribution, which are uh, having following the same distribution. Right, so they're, they're, they they come from the different data distribution, uh, both my train and the test data. For OOD, which stands for out of distribution, uh, we have a difference between the training distributions and the test distribution, as I was reflecting in in this in this example here. So as I said, there are different forms of auto distribution or sometimes a distribution shift, as we call it. So depending on the degree of shift that we have between the train, uh, between the test and the train distribution. So some examples will be the covariate shift where we have uh, the distribution of the input of P of X changes while the distribution of the levels uh, so P of Y given X remains constant. So uh, some cases of that will be uh, like moving from one type of weather to another. So my train set is uh, strangest on daytime, let's say in, uh, in Europe, uh, but then I have in my test set some images of night. So uh, it's the same types of cities, it's the same, uh, well, the same types of people, same types of car. So there's no changes in the labels. However, I have changes in, uh, in, in my input because the, the, the visual input does not look the same. So there's a distribution shift there. Uh, another instance of distribution shift is for completely out of distribution objects or sometimes anomalies, called anomalies. Uh, where we have new object classes that appear at this time. So just completely new objects that we have never seen. Uh, take, for example, a data set again trained in Europe, and then you have, uh, you encounter a rickshaw or, I don't know, a, an animal from the jungle. So this is something that we are unlikely to have seen at train time and that you have to deal now at test time. Uh, and finally, we have what we call uh, the label shift, where Differently from the covariate shift is the distribution of the labels that changes while the input remains uh, constant. So, for example, take uh, a pedestrian detector that was trained, uh, let's say, on the pre-COVID data. So you, you have a certain distribution of the people, a density on the streets. But then if you want to test your classifier, your detector on, uh, let's say, in the period of COVID on the lockdown, where there was very few people on the street. So here. We have, again, the same type of uh, city, so the, the distribution of the input does not change, but the, of the labels changes because we don't have the same amount of people uh, in this, on the streets, on the, si on the subway, and so forth. So this is the, this is the label, uh, label, label shift. Um, in terms of what people are, are looking at, so, uh, so uh, in the real-world conditions, just to give you another, a few other examples, we have what we call domain shifts. So, uh, so I was mentioning day and night, but uh, but actually, yeah, we have we can have actually continuous domain shifts from uh, from daytime to towards night. So we have all the intermediate states that uh, that come in uh, noon, well morning, noon, uh, dawn, pre, uh, after dawn, and in a completely dark night. Uh, we can have variations in in the weather, so from clear to to rainy, well cloudy and uh, well foggy and so forth. And uh, we can have various uh, uh, domain shifts, for example, urban to village to, to rural, where it's, it's completely like a farm. Uh, here are other examples of rain and so forth. So these are examples from a, from a, from a synthetic data set called shift. But we also have in, in computer vision now, we're increasingly having more and more of these types of data sets. For instance, we have cityscapes that we use as training data set. But then we can uh, we can test the, the domain shift on uh, Indian driving data set. So it's a new continent and di different types of vehicles, different types of environments, or on different types of weathers, fog, night, uh, uh, rain, and snow in the, in the ACDC data set that we can, uh, we can find referred into these uh, into these references. Uh, we can have also in, in practice we can have object level shift where uh, we have different types of objects that uh, that appear that we have not seen before. So we have here uh, quite a few challenges right now. Uh, so here we see small objects in, in German cities that we have not seen at all during training. So here is a tire on the road. Here we have a, a bobby car from a, from, a, from, a, from a child, it's a toy. Uh, so this is from the lost and found data set. But then we have some new um, challenges appearing uh, in the past few years. Uh, here we have the segment, if you can, where we have unseen objects at training, like, uh, like um, a cow or a horse with a, with a carriage, uh, the scooters that I was mentioning just before, sheep, tractors. And finally, uh, well, this is a new challenge that we're proposing from my team, the Bravo uh, challenge, where we have encrusted with, uh, with a state of the art generative AI models, we have encrusted new objects on our regular street uh, images. In particular, here we show some examples of animals 
that you may that you are unlikely to encounter or not in, during your training uh, on, on these uh, these cities, but this may uh, may happen to 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 be encountered at one point in uh, in time. Uh, so, still related to 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 the knowledge uncertainty, is this case that I'm outlining here, um, where we have uh, three classes. So this time they're they're relatively easier to separate. But we have a, this class here, which is a comp very imbalanced compared to the others. So whenever we have a new test sample here, I may have a hard time to decide, is this something uh, uh, that belongs to this class or it rather belongs to these classes here? So, so my predict although my predictions in this realm will be relatively okay for these two classes because they're well represented, I may not be sure what to say about this sample here in particular, if it belongs to this class uh, here, which has very few samples. So to give you a more telling example, so here I'm, I'm showing uh, some examples of, of data scarcity. So when you train a pedestrian detector or a pose estimator, you usually have these types of urban images uh, with people uh, in a rather canonical position, although there's quite a bit of diversity in the, in the postures that they have. But then when I'm coming with, uh, with a data set of climbers, so I want to, to analyze um, the posture of these uh, of the pose of these uh, of these climbers. I may have a hard time because this is something that I may not, I did not encounter before. So it's people that I know. So I know how to do in general pose estimation and recognize pedestrians from uh, from cars or from some other objects. But in this position, I may not have my uh, data data coverage uh, done uh, for the training distribution done uh, quite uh, that rich to to identify these types of um, you know, of poses. So wrapping up, so so as you've seen from the examples before, it's this knowledge uncertainty is mostly caused by the lack of knowledge about the process that generated of the data. So it's 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 related mostly to to the model itself. Uh, we can actually uh, reduce it with uh, with additional uh, training data to cover all these uh, these unknown classes that we have at test time, but that in a, in a subsequent training we will know about them. So this is why we also call it reducible uncertainty. Uh, however, in practice, we don't know if we, we've covered everything at uh, all the all the data space, all the distribution that uh, the process that generated the data, and uh, there's always something uh, remaining there, lurking some objects that we have not known about, or a, or uh, an instance of an of an object class that we know that we have not know, don't don't know about, and uh, this is why we call this the unknown unknown. Now, knowing which source of uh, so now that we are become a bit more familiar with the types of uncertainty that we encounter, we'll see how this can be uh, can, can be useful. So uh, knowing that which source of uncertainty is dominant can be useful, for example, uh, in active learning and reinforcement learning. So this is uh, the knowledge uncertainty into play because we can know we we know which samples or which space do we uh, do we want to have new annotations in in active learning uh, because while well, we we identify the areas where we have high knowledge uncertainty or samples, sorry, and in the reinforcement learning, it's again, it gives us a, a indication or which space to explore where we have uh, reduced the knowledge uncertainty. It can be also useful for new data acquisition. So here uh, we can decide which type of uh, samples uh, we want we want to, to acquire or types of conditions of weather conditions or, uh, or environments because we have low knowledge uncertainty in these areas. This is interrelated with active learning so that in active learning we already have the samples that we want to annotate where in new data acquisition, we're looking for new data to acquire and then to apply active learning. Um, it can be helpful also to decide uh, to a certain fall back, to fall back to a certain complementary sensor. So for example, uh, this is a case where data uncertainty. So for example, if, if there's an, it's night and we cannot see too well, we can fall back to, to LIDAR or radar, or we can uh, decide of an action downstream, like increasing the beam intensity of the headlamp so to have like the high beam illuminating further because we don't see uh, too well from with the camera at a certain distance in the night. Uh, the data uncertainty can be also useful to switch to uh, our model to diff multiple predictions. So as we remember the case from the medical imaging where you have different experts uh, different, different, giving different annotations, uh, it might be uh, easier to, to switch to these types of models when you see that there's some, type, uh, some ambiguity in, uh, in the data that we have. Or it can be useful to zoom in on tricky image areas. So if your model, because of computational constraints, resizes the input image to, to smaller images for faster processing, but then you identify an area where it has high data uncertainty, 
you can actually zoom in and have another sample to to take a decision there. Well, if space allow, if uh, if computation constraints allow it on a car, or uh, or in practice if your uh, if your uh, model is running on a server. Uh, if we know the overall uncertainty, so the data plus the knowledge uncertainty, we can uh, we can figure out uh, when is our model failing. So we can uh, we can take a decision on that and say, okay, I'm not sure. Well, because of this and of that, my model is failing now, so I cannot put any confidence on 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 it. Uh, so I have a caveat here uh, to illustrate. So while everything is nice and clean, the way the way I described it so far in terms of separation of the, of the types of uncertainty, but beware that while often these uh, these sources are idealized in practice in real data, we have both types of uncertainties that are intermingled. So we can grasp them to, to some extent, but they're often quite intermingled and, uh, and they're accumulating in the total uncertainty. Uh, then models do not satisfy, uh, uh, sometimes models do not sa always satisfy conditions for uh, for some particular types of uh, uncertainties. For example, the data uncertainty, uh, which I'll be coming back to, to this in, in a moment. Uh, where we need to have models that are uh, putting, uh, giving us reliable uh, probability estimates on the on the on the on the confidence that they have, but since most of the models uh, nowadays are overconfident, this validates some of the assumptions that we have for uh, for some uh, type of uh, uncertainty estimation conditions. So, in general, uh, to separate these sources of uncertainties to to some reasonable quality or extent. Uh, we uh, we typically uh, require a Bayesian a Bayesian approaches, which will be uh, Review uh, just uh, just uh, just in a minute. So to see how can we estimate more reliably the different types of uncertainty, as I said, it will help us to reason uh, in terms of ensembles and put a Bayesian hat. So there are ensembles in Bayesian uh, approaches. You'll see that they're quite uh, quite um, quite uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite related. Before that, I will just illustrate. Well, make some preliminaries uh, in terms of notations and in uh, the in the uh, in the denominations. So here. We consider a training data set D with samples X, Y. Uh, we have N samples and labels uh, of, uh, of this type in our training data set. So when we train a, a model, be it a neural network or a classifier, a simple classifier, so most models fit a single set of parameters to maximize the probability uh, uh, on, the, on the condition of the data. So here, theta are the parameters of my, uh, my model, my neural network. And what we usually, uh, in the optimum that we identify is usually the maximum of the of the probability of the parameters condition of the data. So this is the posterior uh, maximizing the, the posterior probability to to fit this uh, this uh, this the model on the, on this data. So in general, we the way we we write it and it's more typical to to, to have it like that. Uh, it's essentially in this form where we uh, we do the maximum a posterior esti estimation. And if you look a bit, I will not dive uh, too much in, into the details. This is actually you will find here the the minimization of the cross entropy loss. Plus an L2 regular on L regularization because here we have the prior from the from the uh, from a, on, on our parameters. So when we look at the probabilistic approach, what we actually do we estimate the full distribution of our uh, of our parameters theta. So we we have from which we can sample. So we have identified the distribution of the parameters uh, from which our network can can sample and take and take uh, take, uh, take take parameters to to do the prediction. Uh, so this is the general the Bayesian and the probabilistic approach. But in the assembling approach, what we actually do is uh, we have a single set of parameters for each training run. So we have uh, the optimum parameter theta star from one training. We use that. This is our final checkpoint. This is what we use. Uh, then, if we want another set of uh, another another checkpoint, we do another training run with uh, different random seeds, different initialization, different augmentations, and so forth. And we collect a few. A uh, set of parameters like that to generate our ensemble, so we have multiple networks that uh, that are predicting on, on on the same data. So some preliminaries on, on ensembles that I've started a bit in the in the in the in the previous slide. So we view in general our network as a probabilistic model uh, that takes a classification decision uh, for our uh, labels to, to be of a certain class. Uh, for example, to be of a certain class, given it uh, a, a data sample, a text that I sample at the input and the parameters of the network. In general, if I take the, the base uh, the base formula, uh, the model posterior p of theta given the data uh, captures the uncertainty in the parameters theta, and uh, during training we uh, we computed using a using a, a variable, an instance of the of the base theorem that I've shown just before, 
uh, where we can express the, the posterior probability of the, the, the model posterior as, as the likelihood times uh, the, the prior. And, uh, and if you come back to this formula here, where we apply a log and we do a sum, we can, we can find the, the cross entropy plus uh, the regularization term of the prior uh, in, uh, in, our, in our expression. And here we have the evidence, but usually yeah, we don't, we kind of we kind of put this under the carpet, under the rug uh, often uh, the the evidence on on the data distribution uh, from from theta we can actually now that we have found the distribution of our parameters we can actually sample an ensemble of models so I take a different theta m's <coughs> that are sampled from this distribution of uh, of parameters and I have now actually several models several neural networks each with a parameter theta 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 m so I have m models right now that I I have sampled. Uh, to do the prediction now that I have this, uh, several, these several models and predictions, we, we usually ba use Bayesian inference. So this means that uh, the probability of my, uh, the final probability of my, uh, my decision, again, if I view it as a probabilistic model, is the expectance on all the, the predictions that my model, uh, my model made. Uh, but well, what we do in practice, we do Monte Carlo sampling. So we take M. If we use our M, uh, M networks and ensemble of M, M networks, and we average their 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 predictions, uh, and this is our final uh, final prediction. Um, now, how do we use that to, to compute the the total uncertainty and then the remaining types of uncertainties that we we discussed before? So the total uncertainty is the combination of the data uncertainty and the knowledge uncertainty. So the total uncertainty it can be computed from the entropy of the predicted posterior. So here H is the entropy. This is my predicted posterior that we have described before. And uh, if we come back to the formula from before, this is how we compute it. We have the entropy of the expectation uh, over the, of the predicted posterior. And the practice is actually the entropy of the average predictions from uh, the average of the predictions from the, from the, from the, from my, my ensemble. Now, when we go to the data uncertainty, uh so under certain conditions and assumptions meaning that my model has sufficient capacity to fit the data but in such a way that it does not overfit it so we have sufficient training iterations and, and training data uh so my model is not over calibrated over confident so coming back to the the comment that i had before models with probabilistic outputs already capture the uh, the data uncertainty so they can estimate the data uncertainty and this is typically reflected in the entropy of my uh, of my prediction so it's the expectance over the entropy of uh, of my predictions uh so in general the expect the data uncertainty can be typically just from one sample we don't need to have many uh, many not, not always to have many uh, many samples of your sorry of your model that's when I say samples, samples of a model, I apologize for the misnomer. Uh, so, so I can actually do the average of the entropies of my prediction. So here I have a, an ensemble of uh, M models. Uh, the data is expected data uncertainty is the average of the entropies of the individual models, where my models are either sampled from a distribution or they are uh, the checkpoints from, uh, from for my ensemble, uh, ensemble model. So, so this is a bit different because it looks quite similar with what we had before, where we have the expected. Uh, here we have the expected data uncertainty, which is the entropy of the of the predictions. While in the in the in the, in the total uncertainty, we have the entropy of the predictive posterior. So this is the entropy of the average predictions that we that uh, what the expectation of the the posterior. So this is a bit of a different nuance, and it will be clear in a few minutes uh, with uh, with uh, on, on some examples. So now knowing uh now that we have the the total uncertainty and the data uncertainty we can obtain some measure of the knowledge um, of the knowledge uncertainty and when we write it like that so the knowledge uncertainty uh is uh, here the total uncertainty minus the data uncertainty so we can see that we find the formula for uh, for the mutual information that i write here in my so uh so here i have the mutual uh, information uh, uh, measures uh, um, well to some extent the, the knowledge uncertainty so i will not go too much into detail into where does the mutual information come from and all this information theory comes from but to give you an idea of what this formula this equation captures is that uh so if the difference uh if these these two are equal so the the total uncertainty and the, in the data uncertainty it means that my model does not find any new thing on uh, from uh, from uh, this new sample x test 
so there's no new knowledge in the in the in the label uh, in the true outcome y that my model will take. However, if there's a difference there, uh, this difference will capture the the amount of information about the model parameters that we would gain by uh, by uh, having the knowledge of this um, of the outcome of this uh, of this uh, of this sample. Uh, and if you thinking in, in in this in this way and i'll come to that in a, in a, in the in the following slides so mutual information is essentially a measure of the diversity of the ensemble so if my ensemble is diverse and has quite a bit of knowledge in, injected into it uh this will be captured in my uh, in my um, in my mutual uh, in my mutual information so yeah, if i don't have much information uh, to to add this will be uh, this will be uh, this will be zero however if there's new information uh to be added this will be reflected in my in my uh, in my um in, my, uh, in the difference between the total uncertainty and the in the data uncertainty so this will come forward again and again in the in the ensemble literature the focus on having ensembles uh with 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 with, uh, with high diversity so diversity is not just a desirata per se okay we want to have nice ensembles so it's not just a, an artificial request it's something uh, that is quite necessary, in particular when we deal with with unknown samples. So, of course, uh, having diverse ensembles, it does not mean that they always have to disagree. So, we want them to agree in the, on the easy sample. So, they they want to they need to be precise to have uh, to make good predictions. However, the diversity we need it in cases like that, where we can see that well, we given this weird uh, this weird looking objects. If we have different points of view. Uh, so here we see, uh, well, this is 3G objects and we do 2D projections with the light on, on different uh, on different orthogonal planes. So we can see that each plane sees a different a different shape. So this is what we also want to obtain with uh, with uh, diverse ensembles, having a different point of view on a uh, relatively on a, on an on unknown sample. And if these ensembles, these, these members disagree, it means that it's something that we have not seen. So uh, we need to pay some particular attention to it. Uh, to explain uh, the different uh, difference between uh, data uncertainty and data uncertainty, I'll, uh, I'll use this uh, this nice plot from uh, from Andre Malini's um, uh, PhD, where he shows these uh, ensemble predictions on a simplex. On a simplex, we have this triangle where we have here each corner represents a, a class. Uh, we have here uh, the probabilities of, of belonging to, to to each of the three classes. Uh, and each point here represent the predictions from one ensemble member. So in this case here, we have low uncertainty. It's clear that most of the ensemble matter, uh, ensembles predict that there we have here uh, our, uh, our class. So this is a relatively low uncertainty uh, prediction. We have with high confidence that this is the likely class in my, uh, in, uh, in, in my input. Then when we go into data uncertainty, as I said, since we have entropy in the, in the, in the, in the predictions, they should be somewhere in this place here. So since they have entropy, they will be always in between classes. So you can see that there's a concentration between my uh, my predictions somewhere in the middle of all. Right. So it's not narrowing to getting closer to any of these classes. It's somewhere in the in the middle because of the high entropy that I, uh, I'm expecting to have for these uh, ambiguous samples. When we go to knowledge uncertainty, we can see now that uh, because of the diversity, my if this is an ideal setting, of course. Because of the diversity, I have here several. Uh, well, my predictions are all over the, this uh, this simplex. So there's definitely some disagreement that I have between the the predictions. So it's certainly uh, a sample that I have not encountered, and there's quite a bit of diversity. So my sample, my 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 ensembles completely disagree on that because they diverse, and it's easy to figure out that now I have something with with a high knowledge uh, knowledge uncertainty. So. Thanks to, to the, the appealing properties uh, for uncertainty estimation and preparation and separation, sorry, uh, ensembles have easily become one of the key approaches for uh, for uh, for uh, for this task, and this is why I, I decided to to cover them uh, in this part of the tutorial, and then we'll see some alternatives trying to fix uh, one particular uh, one problem of uh, in uh, of reliability, but in this case, but I, here the focus will be on the ensembles because they they have shown to be well one of them uh, was one one model one 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 technique fits all in terms of uh, separating uncertainty and uh, and estimated it uh, it, uh, it properly across all types of uncertainties of course 
you you will see later on that we can do better on a particular type of uncertainty with certain class of methods for on particular knowledge uncertainty. I'm just kind of uh, using here ensembles as a, a one-stop fits all for uh, for the, for the uncertainty estimates that of uncertainty sources that we have seen just before. So so ensembles are actually uh, as world as old as a as the computer vision uh, while well, machine learning goes. So they have been leading to, to state-of-the-art results for decades. So if you remember here, uh, the phase detection algorithm with Ada Boost actually relies on the um, on, on ensembling strategies of weak classifiers to uh, try to locate the, the positions of, of the faces. Uh, and also, well, if you look at the leaderboard in Kaggle, uh, Kaggle competitions, you always have among the winners some form of ensembling that, uh, that contributes to, uh, to a final better, uh, better accuracy of the, of the submitted model. Uh, Ensembles have whether you are uh, you are a theoretician, so I'm putting here a reverend base or, or a more high performance seeker willing to to maximize performance in all conditions. Uh, ensembles are appealing because uh, they are they can be inspiring for some or being really useful for uh, for for the others. Now, just a, a word of well of the disclaimer. So, depending on the community immunity that you are in. One of one of these methods is frequently regarded as a special case for uh, for the other, usually with different assumptions. But and there, well, they used to argue. They are used for arguing uh, one type of uh, one type of argument and, and theory. But mind that these Bayesian approaches as ensembles usually have different mindset, and uh, well, they can inspire each other, but they are relatively uh, relatively uh, relatively different. So, I will first start with uh, with Bayesian neural networks. I will. Uh, I'll not spend too much time on that. It's just to, to refer to, to them because they have shown to be a source of inspiration for, for many methods uh, afterwards. So what is a Bayesian neural network? Uh, it's easiest is to, uh, to compare a Bayesian neural network in comparison with, uh, well, in relation with, uh, with a standard neural network. So here I have a standard neural network where the parameters are represented by single fixed values, which are marked here in purple uh what we that we call point estimate so i'm just doing a forward i have my my networks after training is fixed uh i select the, the final checkpoint and and that's it in a bayesian neural network usually the parameters are are are, are represented by uh by uh actually by uh so there's an error here i will i'll fix it in the in the final uh uploaded pdf uh so we actually uh, parameters are represented by uh, by uh, by by a distribution so we don't have any any more single fixed values. Actually, each parameter is uh, is representing a certain distribution. So, for example, if you have a Gaussian prior, each parameter consists now in of a pairs of uh, two uh, two values, sigma and mu, that describe a distribution that uh, that uh, fit that well that describe well distribution around this parameter. Sorry for the double um, redundancy in the wording. So uh, so now uh, what this means that in this case that my uh, my Bayesian neural network has it's essentially two times more parameters because each parameter now comes in two uh, of a sigma and a mu from which at at, uh, at a runtime I sample my uh, my values. So this is you can see that since I have a distribution of each parameter, it comes comes easily to to sample different networks and have an ensemble of, of predictions at, at runtime compared to here where I have fixed values. So I essentially have one just uh, one just uh, one single checkpoint from which I can do uh, predictions upon. So in general, Bayesian neural networks are, are really easy to formulate, but they're difficult to, to perform in Princeton, and I'll, uh, we'll discuss a bit about that, uh, because we have to, uh, well, we have, in particular for deep neural networks, where we have in the order of millions of parameters, uh, we need to, to fit the distributions for, for all, these, uh, or all, all, all these parameters. So the modern Bayesian neural networks simplify a bit of the, the, the pipeline, and uh, train the networks with variational inference with a reparameterization trick. And uh, here we uh, we assume that each parameter, so each synapse of the of the neural network, is is independent. So this is a strong assumption, uh, but it allows us to, to train uh, deep uh, Bayesian neural networks through the reparameterization trick, where we sample um, at each forward we sample from this distribution. Which are the learned parameters? We sample a new uh, a new weight. We do the forward. Then when we do backward with the reparameterization trick, we actually train the mu and the sigma of each uh, of each uh, of each parameter to uh, towards uh, this uh, this uh, this optimum. So 
the reason, but even so, this uh, this has some very strong assumptions, and it's even so, it, it does not, uh, it's not that easy to train. So recent methods try to simplify this uh, this uh, this pipeline and consider just the last layer as variational. So everything is uh, is fixed points, and then the last layer is is variational, which is this is the the most uh, one of the most common methods that uh, that is used from this family is the Laplace redox, or uh, other methods consider that just a part of the parameters across the layers are considered as variational. So I'm giving this example here from subnetwork inference, where we select uh, given a, a neural network architecture, we select a subnetwork uh, according to a criteria that we uh, we defined beforehand, and in this subnetwork we consider that the parameters are variational, so we can uh, train them with uh, with Bayesian optimization, and then at runtime. We have a mix of uh, variational parameters for which we sample values and uh, and mix them well and they make predictions jointly with uh, with the, with, the, with the fixed values. So this allows us to have different variations of the same network. And I'm giving some examples uh, here of LPBNN or or subnetwork inference of uh, recent papers that uh, that make an attempt into in this area. So I'm done a bit with uh, with the, with the Bayesian part and dive you to uh, introduce you to the simplest. Uh, one of the simplest methods for uh, for ensembling, which is simple assembling, uh, it's called deep ensembles. So what we do here, uh, I'm showing here different training trajectories. So we actually run the regular uh, stochastic gradient descent training on different, taking the same on, on architecture. We take different initializations uh, and different uh, different random seeds for the initializations for the order of the batches for the data augmentations, and uh, train until. Uh, well, until uh, until convergence or until our um, our uh, training recipe tells us so, and we have at the end a, a collection of checkpoints uh, at different in different places of this uh, landscape of uh, of the optimization. So at this time, what we do, we just average the the predictions of uh, coming from these uh, multiple ensembles, and that's it. So this is a really simple technique. Uh, it can generalize to different types of problems: classification, regression, uh, single output, two uh, D output, you name it. It's uh, it in general it leads to very good performance across benchmarks and uh, and it's agnostic to the underlying architecture. On the downside, so the computational cost for uh, for ensembles grows linearly both during training because I have to train m m uh, m networks, but also at test time because I have to make to hold in memory m networks and make m uh, m m separate predictions. So so these uh, deep ensembles have are currently well I'm most of the time sought out across different tasks and benchmarks. Uh, for their predictive performance and their uncertainty estimation, because they are usually also diverse. So just by the fact of training with different random seeds, starting with different random initialization already ensures a diversity in the in their predictions. So uh, um, they are currently very used for uh, for offline computation, like uh, on a server side for computing pseudo labels or for doing run active learning. But in general, they are uh, if you want to to integrate them in real time decision systems, their computational cost is is quite uh, is quite prohibitive. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in the past years, they have been an immense imp uh, inspiration for several subsequent works, uh, works that improve their computational costs in terms of uh, uh, memory at runtime or memory during training or testing, size and number of networks needed, type of architecture that imitates ensembles and so forth. So this was done having in mind the preservation of uh, of as many of the desirable properties of ensemble so sometimes people wanted to predict to keep the predictive performance others wanted to to keep the the diversity or both so while while reducing overall the the computation footprint of, uh, of ensembles so in the following i will take a quick tour of some of the recent uh, deep uh, well deep ensemble variants that have uh, been appearing across uh, the the last few years to give you an idea of what the people have been working on so first, I'll try to I'll start with ensembles that are obtained from one single training run. So this, in this case, I want I have the budget for for training just one neural network, and but I want some ensembles from it. So what what uh, what can be done here is to given my trajectory during optimization. So here I'm doing gradient descent. Uh, what I can do to get my ensemble, I can collect intermediate checkpoints. So we can either collect them uh, across the training. Uh, to collect these checkpoints, save them on disk and to make an ensemble. Or we can, at some point later in the training, we activate cyclic learning rate, and uh, which is uh, which is shown here, where my um, uh, my learning rate is is increasing and increasing, increasing and increasing like that. So at the end of each cycle, 
I, I take a, I take a, I take a checkpoint and I, uh, and I use it for, for my assembly. So this is really simple to set up. Uh, it has a low computational cost of training and it generally gives good predictive performance, but we, uh, we need still need to have an assemble at test time. So we have multiple networks and multiple forwards. Uh, there's a limitation of the diversity of the predictions because they're all, the checkpoints come from the same trajectory of training. So they can be quite similar. And, uh, and there's some instability if checkpoints are sampled from the early training steps, as this was done initially, but now nowadays uh, most of the people do, uh, do it at a, at a late stage with uh, when a cycle clearing rate is, is launched. Uh, another type of approaches in, in the ensemble literature are the Bayesian neural networks that are obtained from one single training run. So I was telling you that Bayesian neural networks are quite hard to train uh, because we want to fit a distribution around the parameters. There's the reparameterization trick, but there's also a, a major um, hit back. A uh, major inconvenient is this uh, weight independence assumption, which can, can destabilize uh, training uh, uh, at scale. So an alternative approach to obtain uh, ensembles for cheap, Bayesian neural networks for cheap, sorry, is, is to, to look at the single training trajectory and, uh, and use the checkpoints, as we saw before. So we have here the intermediate checkpoints on my trajectory. We use them to collect uh, and collect them, and then for each weight, uh, we use the several sequence that we have uh, collected, to est and we use that to estimate the distribution around each parameter. So, uh, so as we have find, and this transforms our uh, our initial network well sequence of checkpoints into a Bayesian neural network, <coughs> because now I have a distribution around my um, around each uh, each parameter. So this method is called SWAG from stochastic weight averaging uh, Gaussian. It's, it's one, it's a very powerful technique for getting uh, Bayesian neural networks for, for cheap. So this is relatively simple to set up. It gives good performance and it, it's faster training because we just, again, have just one, uh, one, uh, one, uh, one training uh, uh, process. And, uh, and, and we hold just one, uh, one, essentially we just hold one network uh on this but uh, well at one time we can sample from this distribution and have these uh, multiple different forwards uh, uh and the drawback for this is that well even though it's a single a single training process we need several uh, checkpoints to explore such that we have uh, some diversity for for fitting our distribution uh well we're still assembled at, 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 at test time because we have multiple forwards so while multiple networks depends on how we we deal with it we can either store them and uh, then process them in parallel, or we can uh, we can uh, sample at each forward, but this makes our, our, our process a bit more more complicated. So it doesn't solve all our problems at this time. It it, it, it remains relatively uh, expensive, although it can be uh, less expensive than uh, cheaper than uh, than ensembles. Uh, another drawback is that we have limited diversity in the predictions because again we sample our checkpoints from uh, from the same training trajectory. An alternative and similar uh, take on that is is based by uh, is, is on this paper on uh, Tradi tracking distributions, where we we look at uh, at the at the trajectory over uh, gradient descent of the parameters of our neural network, and we uh, we try to track uh, this trajectory with with a Kalman filter. So Kalman filters actually can uh, can estimate a, a distribution, a predicted distribution of the parameters using also a prior. So by tracking the the descent of our uh, of our parameters towards the minimum, at the end we we can have an estimation of of their distribution, and we can sample an ensemble from this final distribution to run uh, multiple uh, multiple multiple forwards. So the the cons are very similar with SWAG. So we have good perf uh, well, um, well, we have we still have an ensemble at test time, and we have limited diversity in the predictions. However, on the upside, we just have one training uh, process without cyclic learning rate, so it's it's even shorter than uh, than before, and uh, it does not have any impact on training because well the tracking is done on the model on the side that does not impact the optimization, right? and it gets in general gets a very good uh, predictive performance. So now I'm moving on to a, a new type of uh, a different type of. Um, uh architecture where we have multiple forwards over one network so this is one of the most simplest things that we we could do in practice so uh we take a single network and we leverage data augmentations at test time to mimic an ensemble so and during training we don't do any change 
At test time, we apply different data augmentations on the input and run multiple forwards with it. So this is a, it's really, uh, really effective and it's often used in, in all sorts of challenges to, to get an ensemble of predictions from a, from a single neural network. So the app on the advantage is this is very simple. It boosts the predictive performance and we just have one network at test time. On the downside, we have multiple forwards at train time and uh, there's, some, there's a limited diversity because we, uh, we essentially use the same network. Uh, uh, and uh, in general, works better if the network is calibrated, so we have to be mindful of that. And it can be tricky for distribution shifts because we may need to fit either the calibration of the net or of the network, either the, the data augmentations to reflect this uh, this uh, this distribution shift. Uh, another way of doing uh, of getting an ensemble from multiple forwards of the same network is the largely known uh, Monte Carlo dropout. Uh, so I'll, I'll not go to, into too much details for it, but for some, those that are not familiar, so in, in, a, in dropout, uh, dropout is a regularization technique where at train time we apply, uh, we, we mask out neurons, uh, we put them uh, their output essentially to zero such that we'll have different uh, other neurons cooperating and, uh, and taking a decision. So commonly in dropout, we apply uh, the, the dropout, dropping out uh, neurons at train time, and at test time, we uh, we keep them on. But uh, what we do in Monte Carlo dropout, we keep the dropout activated also at test time, and we forward with different uh, dropout masks. So this will be like different sub networks that uh, that take a decision uh, on 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 a given a given sample. So this again is very simple to train. It gives good predictive performance, and we just have one network to store. Uh, on the cons, um, we still need to do multiple forwards, and there's some limited diversity in the in the predictions. And while this is more in convenience of uh, dropout layers, is that we don't have yet a very good way of using uh, dropout on convolutional layers. And since most of the networks can be convolutional uh, well, in the ResNet era, uh, you have very few places where you can uh, can apply uh, can apply the dropout. Of course, in the era of vision transformers, this uh, this part is uh, is re it will be revisited, and maybe we'll see more and more of MC dropout coming back into uncertainty, cheap uncertainty estimation in, uh, in neural networks. A uh, variant of, uh, of dropout is mask samples, uh, where the, the principle is similar. It's just that unlike dropout, where we were um, uh, doing random masks each time uh, for the dropout, here we, uh, we have a set of fixed masks uh, that we, uh, we activate each time, and then a test we forward over, over each mask. So it's a more guided, let's say, guided dropout with a controlled a set of uh, of, uh, of masks that we uh, we use at, at runtime. So this again is kind of in the same spirit as dropout. It's simple to train. It gets give it a good performance. We have one network at test time. We may need actually the problem is that we may need two training iterations. One to train the full network and then and estimate the masks to have the most promising masks uh, like in the lottery ticket um, uh, hypothesis. And then train again with with these masks. So this might be double the train time. Uh, we still, uh, in, uh, among the cons, we still need multiple forms of train time, and we have some uh, some limited diversity in the, in the in the predictions. So I will be moving now to one uh, one final set of uh, methods, which are ensemble-like architectures with one single forward. So before we've seen different ways that uh, strategies that were focusing more on the parameters, on the learning on finding something that imitates ensembles in terms of the, um, the parameters of the distribution or in the number of, of outputs. In these types of methods, we are looking at some, some changes in the architectures that make the networks behave like an ensemble with some computational overhead, but usually it's less significant compared to, to ensembles and to have the behavior of, a, of an ensemble from one network. So the first example that I will offer here is the MIMO, which stands for multi-input, multi-output. So here, what we want is to, to, to find different sub-network paths that are learned implicitly by large networks. So what we do here, we, uh, this was inspired by the lottery ticket hypothesis where it was shown that in general, you need just a subset of the, of the parameters uh, uh, to, to, to actually to make, to, make, to make predictions. So the authors, what they did here, okay, look, we know that the network is not optimal in using these parameters. So we can uh, have it process, have it uh, uh, let it do three or two, two, three tasks at a time. So they change the first input layer such that it can take multiple, multiple images at input. Then the feature maps are merged. 
uh, after the first convolutional layer. And then at the end, the network has as many heads as inputs for each doing a, a particular, a particular uh, classification task. So at this time, what we do is we don't, we don't use different uh, images. We use different augmentations of the same image. And we have multiple decisions from our multi-head network doing, uh, doing, the, doing the predictions. Mind that this idea of having multiple, uh, multiple heads was also explored before. But in that case, we just had one, one, uh, one input with multiple prediction heads. And usually they were all, they're all across uh, the same set of classes. Uh, so all heads were predicting you know, among the same set of classes. So they're not doing multiple tasks. Uh, so this is method. This method is really too simple to train. Gets a good predictive performance, and it's really cheap computation because you just have to add, uh, a, well, change the convolutional layers and have more soft, well, more uh, classification layers, and that's that's it. On the downside, uh, we have a limited diversity in the predictions, and uh, the sub networks are uh, are not independent. So uh, we uh, we have some collaboration in these in networks here. So there's there's some limited diversity because uh, because of that and uh, what we've seen in practice is that uh, this approach tends to saturate as we increase the number of subnetworks so beyond already at three so beyond three on image network there is an shift it becomes quite tricky to to do so you cannot go beyond three three three, uh, three subnetworks uh, Another idea for uh, for uh, for getting ensembles for cheap is is uh, architectures uh, for cheap is called batch ensemble so here we uh, we parameterize each weight matrix as a new weight matrix uh, w bar uh, that is low rank and we can uh, we can decompose it as a as a product of two vectors here r and t so when we multiply r and t we get a matrix vector here oh, sorry a matrix of weights here and we multiply them with uh, with the weights of my uh, of my neural network and this gives us an, a different uh, set of uh, set of weights and so they have this concept of uh, slowly moving uh, weights, which are uh, these ones. So they're common and shared across the task. And then the network has these uh, this set of parameters R and T, which are uh, one dimensional. Uh, we multiply them to get a, uh, a matrix of weights, and we call them. Uh, these are the uh, what we call fast weights because they different uh, move at a different pace than uh, than uh, the main ones. We generate a perturbation matrix essentially. Uh, we perturb, uh, we do a dot pro um, Hadamard product uh, component-wise with uh, with the shared weights, and we have a new uh, new set of uh, weights for the ensemble. And we have usually around four uh, sets of weights to to uh, uh, to do for for our ensemble. So what is what's happening within the same network? I essentially spawn in this case two, but usually it's four four uh, four networks that then have the join at the same output. Then again, they are so spawned and so forth. So this idea is currently reused. Uh, if you are fo following the large language models literature by this LoRa LoRa technique, low rank approximation, where they use a similar idea for training a new set of parameters on top of the of the of the shared of the of the large uh, shared ones. So here at training time and at test time, we just have a single forward. This is has an excellent trade computational trade off as a method and gives good predictive performance. But again, we have some limited diversity in the predictions. And the sub networks, these ones are not always independent because eventually they learn to collaborate because they see the same samples uh, all, uh, together. Uh, so the final method that I will describe here is uh, is one of the most recent ones. It's called the uh, packed ensembles. So here, uh, as I was showing, we want the we want to to get the uh, the benefits of an ensemble, but using a single single uh, network architecture or, or the budget of a single network architecture. And preserve its uh, its uh, its uh, its diversity. So the authors argue that to have uh, uh, diversity in the weights, uh, the networks need to be trained uh, independently. So you still need to have multiple networks. But the gist here is that uh, the networks are uh, enveloped in their under the, the the budget of a single network uh, network architecture. So I'm showing here the regular single network, deep ensembles with uh, with several networks. In here, in packed ensembles, they are all under the same network, which is a bit wider than the standard network to fit in these uh, these small uh, these small uh, small networks. And I'm showing here what's it about. So the authors here yeah, make use of um, of uh, depth-wise convolutions or separated convolutions to separate feature maps in the network. Right. So here we have uh, convolutions from one uh, from one filter, then convolutions from one, uh, the other filter. So 
with these uh, uh, group convolutions, we can separate different subnetworks in the in the in the network. So we have the network blue and the ne the orange network that generates. So the blue network generates uh, the blue features that are are processed by other blue filters. Uh, and the in the net in the the orange subnetwork uh, has the corresponding feature maps to generate other feature maps that are processed by some orange filters, and then they make their, their own prediction. Right? So, so within this network, thanks to these stepwise convolutions, we can actually separate different uh, different subnetworks that are trained uh, from uh, from the same data, but in a completely independent uh, manner because they do not interact with uh, with each other. Uh, so when we look at the performance. So I'm showing now a performance comparison of most of the methods that we have seen uh, seen today. So here I'm looking at the task of image classification <clears throat> on Cypher 10 and Cypher 100 with uh, with ResNet 50 architectures and ensembles of four subnetworks. Uh, and we usually look at different metrics in these types of papers. We look at uh, the classification accuracy, accuracy and negative log likelihood, uh, the calibration. You'll find out more about this in uh, in the talk of Puneet. The performance on auto distribution detection. So here we use another data set unseen during training and look at uh, how, uh, how is the model predicting on this type of data set. And you also look at the, comp um, the computational complexity, number of parameters, and uh, multiplications and, uh, and additions. So when we look there, it seems that uh, independent ensembles, packed ensembles, and deep ensembles usually achieve better performance. Uh, while packed ensembles does this with, uh, with a significantly lower computational budget compared to, to deep ensembles. So in terms of parameters, this is um, significantly lower and same for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for computational operations. Uh, when we go to, to larger scale to ImageNet, so here we're looking at different ResNet variants, ResNet 50 and ResNet 50 times four, again, with the, with the, same, uh, with the same models. Uh, we we have similar conclusions, but just uh, so we classify we uh, we look at the classification in domain. So here, performance in domain. Sorry, on the ImageNet. So this is the validation set of ImageNet. All models are trained on ImageNet in accuracy and the expected calibration. Then we look at some out of distribution data set. So this is a texture data set, uh, and here we have another <clears throat> data set for out of distribution specifically for ImageNet, which is called ImageNet O. And we finally look at at um, a distribution shift on ImageNet R. So here we again look at accuracy and likelihood and, uh, and calibration. So when we look at, uh, at, at the results, it seems that uh, single networks and ensembles of, uh, of relatively partially dependent some networks tend to do better in, in, in domain evaluation. So they do better on, uh, on, on ImageNet. However, when we go to auto distribution, well, distribution shifts and auto distribution, it seems that independent ensembles generalize better uh and one well, in general do 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 uh, do much better in uh, in these conditions while having decent or not so bad performance on uh, on on in distribution uh so when we analyze the computational cost uh, versus performance of of different uh, different uncertainty quantification techniques so we have here uh in this plot i'm showing the size of the circle shows the computation the number of parameters on this axis, we have the, the inference speed, so Im the image throughput, so images per second processed. And here we have the accuracy. So you can see that deep ensembles are doing quite well, but they're very costly, so they have very, very, very slow speed. Uh, single networks are and MIMO, they're, they're very fast uh, because they essentially have the, the computational cost of a forward. Uh, but their performance is not uh, not always that uh, well. It's nice, but but it's not uh, it's not uh, the top performance. While with different variants of packed ensembles that we have here, we have a decent uh, decent throughput, and uh, in some cases the performance and some it's it's often is better than than in deep ensembles. So when we go a bit to 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 the output tasks like semantic segmentations. Uh, Again, evaluating the the most of the met some of the methods that we we described so far, in particularly uh, well the simple baseline, uh, Tradi, Mimo, Batch Ensemble, uh, Leap Series BNN, which is a BNN that um, is from uh, from the first types of methods that I was describing, and deep, deep ensembles. So you can see that the behaviors on semantic segmentation do not follow exactly what we have in in uh, in image classification. In general, deep ensembles perform best on uh, on auto distribution. So we can see uh, th these are the um, the auto distribution uh, 
performances that we have here. So this is in, in distribution and these are out of distribution metrics. And this is the calibration. So in general, deep ensembles does, does best there. Uh, when we look at distribution shifts, so here, uh, I forgot to mention, this is the task of semantic segmentation on uh, with models trained on uh, on cityscapes here. And here they are on the street hazards data set where we have, uh, this is specifically for out of distribution. While here we train on cityscapes, which is daytime data. And then we evaluate on rain images, on fog images, and on corrupted images. So here, uh, ensembles do not, well, they, they still are among the top performers, but other variants of ensembles that are usually, that are computational cheaper, uh, follow through. So they're, uh, they're, they're close by and they're, uh, they're narrowing the performance with, uh, with deep ensembles, which is uh, what it means that here the inductive biases that we have for, for these types of tasks can be helpful to, to, to count, well, to, to outperform uh, deep ensembles that have a higher computational complexity. Uh, so as we were saying, diversity is a key component of deep of ensembles in the, in the Bayesian approaches. Uh, and we saw with packed ensembles and deep ensembles that they have, uh, they, uh, they're out, they're outperform the other methods in, a, in, a, in, a, in the diversity of their predictions. And this is kind of what gives them an edge on distribution shift and on auto distribution. So we looked in this paper at uh, different sources of diversity and looked at how it they impact the metrics. So we had the three types sources of, uh, of stochasticity, sorry, in the training of the new neural network. So ND corresponds to non-deterministic backpropagation algorithm. So here, if you have the apex, for example, in PyTorch that uh, that scales the gradients and well does the the mean precision of your uh, of your uh, of your uh, of your parameters, uh, whether we non use it or use it, uh, different initialization. So different. This is different uh, random seeds, <clears throat> differently for the initialization of the weights, and DB is different composition of the batches. So when we have none of that, so we train the network. Uh, several networks in parallel with uh, without the stochastic uh, diver with the stochastic non-deterministic propagation uh, back propagation without different initialization and without uh, different batches well there's no diversity we have good performance but no diversity essentially here mutual information on mean distribution and auto distribution however already by adding the non-deterministic uh, propagation we can see that already we we have inserted Quite a bit of diversity in both in distribution and out of distribution. Then, as we gradually add the other sources of diversity, the scores improves further. But we are already in a good starting point with uh, just by using these um, these uh, these uh, non-deterministic uh, backpropagation. And in the case of deep packed ensembles, these things uh, goes really well because uh, we cannot we do not necessarily have different composition of the batches because for the networks we have the same uh, the same uh, the same batches. Uh, but we do have different initialization, and this is enough to to give us an edge on top of deep ensembles. Uh, I will conclude with uh, with a few recent trends uh, from uh, from uh, from the literature in the context of uh, of foundational models. Uh, and one of the dominant trends that I've seen so far is the use of weight averaging. So weight averaging is, is a method well, that goes back to 2018 from um, from Ismailo et al. Uh, where in the same idea of using a cyclic learning rate to collect different checkpoints, uh, differently from uh, from SWAG, in a, where we were fitting a distribution uh, on top of the weights from the checkpoints, here we're just uh, averaging all the checkpoints. So we do a pair weight averaging across the checkpoints, and this gives us the theta uh, WA, which is our final network. So now we have just one single network have, uh, obtained by averaging all the intermediate checkpoints of my of my network and at this time i have just one single forward the intuition here is that with uh, with these different checkpoints i i have explored my uh my optimization space around the around the wall the global minimum or the nice minimum that i want to touch and by averaging all these checkpoints that are exploring different parts of the space i'm widening this plat plat this uh this part of the optimization space by uh by putting my network in a more stable minimum that is flatter and that can generalize uh, generalize better. So this idea has been revisited and pushed forward in the context of uh, of model soups, uh, in the, where we start from foundation models that are very difficult to train. So we have your clip model or or large VIT that you know that takes so long to train. So you don't want to restart from scratch. So you start from this checkpoint. And then this is a, already a, a, a well-placed checkpoint close to the minimum for a given task. And what we do afterwards, 
we we'll start fine tuning this checkpoint uh, with different hyperparameters, and we get a set of uh, of, uh, of other check, fine tuned checkpoints for our task of interest. So once we have obtained these uh, these checkpoints, we again we average them and we obtain our uh, our uh, our uh, our final network, which is just one single network. Uh, without so much uh, complications of training, so there is of course a requirement for that to to be work to to work. So the the weights should remain linearly connected. So this means that okay, we need to start. We we cannot start from scratch. We need to start from a common basis, which is of parameters, which is this uh, theta pre train from our foundational model. Uh, so the performance here is really nice. So it's a simple method. Uh, we get per boost of performance on distribution shift. Uh, the, the downside for these types of methods is that currently uh, they all tend to lose in calibration for some reason. Uh, so this is one of the well, maybe an uh, research avenue for, uh, for for some of you to to explore uh, the improvements of uh, losses in calibration that we have in, uh, in this uh, in these models. Uh, so I just without going too much into detail because it's out outside the scope of this tutorial, I just want to highlight uh, the work of Alexandre Ramé in this area who has been looking at different ways of achieving model soups. So he has quite a few papers on, on this area. Uh, and he points that, uh, well, we, uh, diversity is also useful uh, in, the, in the case of model soups, because uh, diversity in the weight aver averaging reduces variance. And this is what usually dominates in distribution shifts. So you don't want, you don't have, you have need something to, to deal with, uh, with uh, with the, with the variance in, uh, in distribution shifts. So he has quite a few works, in particular the model Ratatouille, uh, where he shows that, uh, which is here, that if you do, if you start from a checkpoint and uh, your foundation model, you train your checkpoint on, you fine tune out on different intermediate tasks. So it can be, uh, I don't know, classification of dogs and cats, classifications in cars and trucks and so forth. So you have different, either different data sets or different tasks. You fine tune these models here. And they have diversity because they are looking at different tasks. And then you uh, you just do a linear probe of to adapt them to your task of interest. So where you fi fine tuning for the, the target uh, class of interest. And then you do the soup. You are way better than all these, uh, these variants that have been tried uh, before uh, and that are referenced in, the, in, the, in, the, in this table here. Like uh, fusing intermediate uh, pre-trainings, um, uh, doing what is called inter-training, like train on a on a heavier foundation model, train on intermediate task, and then fine-tune on your target tasks and so forth. So we have different variants, and this seems to be working so far the best, uh, thanks to the diversity that we have in the in the models that we we average. And the final highlight on the, on the recent trends is that. I guess we have seen well in this in the, in the preview well in CVPR and ICSV the emergence of uh, visual language models for computer vision tasks, where we have an image encoder and a text encoder, and the classification the decision is done by matching the text the visual embeddings with the text embeddings of the class that we classes that we have um, uh, given to to our text encoder. So you can see there that already we have a few methods uh, to do ensembling on the text encoder side. To, to boost performance, so they have different types of uh, prompts uh, and select the proper weighting for them to better identify the task, uh, well, the class that we have in the input under distribution shift or under a specific uh, specific conditions. So this is an emerging area that we've seen uh, emerging just uh, just recently with uh, some first crafted uh, ensembling strategies for uh, for, uh, for for clip. Though the original clip paper also had ensembling. Uh, by averaging different types of prompts on the text side, uh, which was also a form of, of ensembling. So wrapping up, uh, so understanding the different sources of uncertainty can um, it's useful to we have shown that it is useful to uh, to decide uh, the actions and the in the applications that we have downstream. In general, ensembles are better equipped to separate the sources of uncertainty. So this is why we looked at them today. Uh, the key for that is the diversity of the ensembles. This allows us to be more reliable in terms of predictions, but also in terms of uncertainty estimates. Uh, we have seen that there are several emerging um, uh, alternative approaches for ensembles that are computationally efficient and try to imitate their properties. Uh, but most of the methods are, are often below or specific to uh, below the performance of ensembles or specific to a type of architecture. Uh, as emerging trends, we, we have seen the model soups where we can harness the powers of, uh, of foundation models by just having then one forward pass into a single network and also emerging uh, uh, 
ensembling techniques for for visual language models where the ensembling is done on the on the text encoder side and uh, with that i will uh, conclude this talk and uh, i'll invite you to to watch uh, the talk from uh, from uh, from Ponit on calibration which is starting just now thank you